talk today is even Hemi wasn't Hemiway. Details, reaching me, et cetera. We were at a happy hour last night. A lot of people asked me, well, what is your talk about? Which led to some odd conversations. I would say, well, you know, it's a talk about refactoring. Except I never really tell you how to refactor. I do, I kind of type up, talk about types of refactoring and what they can offer you, when you might want to do them, what they can and can't do. But mostly what I want to do is talk about why you might want to be happy to refactor. And I want to do that in the context of looking at what real writers do. Something that writers do, well, they keep changing their words. Um, it's kind of an awkward sentence. Writers write several drafts, to make that shorter. Writers edit. Succinct, but I honestly never even understood what editing is. And I was an editor for a while, so you'd think I'd know. Writers rewrite. I like that, it's descriptive. And if you were to Google that, you might find this, a quote from E.B. White, which is called, the best writing is rewriting. But honestly, what happens when I Google that is that I get this. And that tells me that rewriting is so valuable to writers that they've even rewritten their own maxim about rewriting. Uh, so it's obviously got to have some value there. And if you look into it, what you'll find is that writers like rewriting because it sharpens their message and it clarifies and teaches them about the story it is they're trying to tell. Ernest Hemingway was real blunt about first drafts. Uh, if you Google anything about Ernest Hemingway in draft, this is what you find. About a million results with this. And here he is doing some of that rewriting. He's taking a draft here of I don't know what and revising it to something like this. Now I'm focusing on Hemingway here, not so much because I like him. Personally, I never really cared for the guy. But his style is known for its precision and its terseness and its clarity. And these are all things that I strive for in my own code. And I also really like that Hemingway was upfront and honest about how much work his style took. He never claimed to be a magical unicorn that could write perfect first drafts and then just be done. And now some of you might be wondering, why I keep comparing what I want to do with a prose writer, I think there's an obvious question here, or a statement, hey, coding's not writing. What Hemingway does is somehow distinctly different from what we do, to which I would say that's wrong. Sure, it's writing. It tells stories, really small stories in this case. It's also a really dumb story, but it does tell a story. Your story might be terse and small and simple, your story could be large and complex with lots of branching statements. But it is going to be a story. Just like real writers, your code is going to have drafts. At the time I took this screenshot of the Rails master branch, it had 53,000 commits. Uh, and that was yesterday. It's probably up to 54,000 by now. So that's a lot of drafts. Every single one of those is someone coming in saying, this story is not right. I need to change it. Code has rewrites. We just don't use that word. We call it refactoring. Uh, we don't really like that rewrite word because I think we've all been on projects that were doomed from the first minute someone said, well, we're just going to totally rewrite this. And then you kind of cower in fear. You, know, you can also prove that coding is writing just by using simple logic. If you start off with the, the premise that if writing is rewriting and we rewrite code, then hey, coding must be writing. I will warn you, but I never did take a logic class. I was a drama major, so, you know, what do I know? This leads us to a quandary. If coding is writing, and professional famous writers like Hemingway can't write good first drafts, or second drafts, or third drafts, then what hope do we have about writing good code early on? You're doomed. You're not going to do it. Uh, just like a real writer, you're going to have to rewrite your code. And as you work with your code, you are going to learn the story that your code is trying to tell. And as you learn that story, you can refactor or rewrite your code to make it tell that story. Honestly, in many ways, real writers have it better. They get to publish their work. Sometimes, right? 
Uh, books and articles and things that are published don't tend to change a lot after they've shipped. Us poor programmers, we're not at all that lucky. Our code is never finished. As long as it's running somewhere, we probably need to make changes to it. Unless you're working on embedded code that is impossible to change, your code's never going to be done. Which tells me that your code is always going to be a draft. You're always going to be learning about it, you're always going to be improving it, you're always going to be rewriting it. So you better get really good at rewriting. But just don't call it that, because people will get nervous. Call it refactor. And just telling you to get good at refactoring is not helpful advice. There's nothing actionable you can really do with that. Saying, well, just get good at refactoring is kind of like teaching someone to dance by dropping them off at Radio City Music Hall and just yelling, good luck. Hope you enjoy the Rockettes. Refactoring is a big topic. There are a lot of different ways to refactor. They all have different goals. And whatever you're trying to approach you pick is it's just going to depend on what you're trying to achieve. So I'm going to quickly kind of go through two general families of refactorings and show you what they can do and what they can't. And since we have these real writers, and since our coding is writing, it turns out we can use the same techniques. So let's look at Hemingway again. So what is he doing here? It's a little hard to see. The picture's grainy. But I see a lot of crossed out words replaced with other words. Maybe sometimes a whole sentence is gone. And we can follow an example like this in code. You know, the hot new lemur.io site lets people manage their lemur collections. And for whatever reason, lemurs like to change their names a lot. So the owners want to be able to rename all of their lemurs at once using randomly picked names. This code works. But we can do some rewriting on this, kind of like what we saw Hemingway do. Right? So what have we done here? Not very much. But we've changed some opaque variable names like x to something useful like lemur. We've replaced that loop with a more idiomatic block since it's just one line. And we changed how we get a random lemur name, so it's a little bit clearer that that name is random. This is all to the good, right? Style changes like this are massive boons to everyone who has to look at this code including you next week, or that new developer, or whoever. Style like this clearly matters. Hemingway didn't write sentences like this. But we also have to ask ourselves, what do we end up changing? Because the story that code tells is exactly the same. We still loop through a collection of lemurs, and we give each one a new randomly selected name from lemur names. This code is much cleaner, it's much easier to understand, but that story that it tells hasn't changed. So what have we changed? We've changed style, but we didn't change the code structure. So I would call this stylistic refactoring. Martin Fowler calls these kinds of refactorings uh, litter pickup sometimes. He calls them comprehension refactorings. Uh, I think stylistic refactoring as an umbrella term kind of encompasses both of those things. So what can it do? It's going to clarify your story. It's going to ease comprehension. It's great to use this at that point where you've finished a method and it works and you just need to clean it up. You don't really need to change the story. Because what it can't do is change that story that your code is telling. You can make your story easier to understand, but you're not going to change its plot. So I'll take a little quick poll here. If you think of your day, how much of it is spent improving your coding style versus changing the code to do something new or better. And I think you know, most of my job, and I suspect most of yours, is changing the story that my code tells. So what this tells me is that as important as comprehensible code is, I probably can't spend my entire day just tweaking variable names. So how do we change our stories? We can go back to Hemingway again. How, do they, how did he do it? There's only one picture, by the way, of Hemingway editing his own work. This is it. Um, so here he is. His rewrites also involve, involve really large structural changes. Um, he'd written several chapters of that novel, The Sun Also Rises, before he decided the, to just change the main character. This wasn't a simple matter of renaming that character. 
he actually had to throw out everything he'd written and write the book again about a whole new main character. And this led to my reaction, you know, wait, what do you mean that Hemingway didn't even know the, own, the main character of his own novel? That seems ridiculous to me. You're a writer, you're writing a novel, of course you know who it's about. But what this tells us is something important about story, which is that we can't know it in advance. You can have a rough idea of what that story is gonna be. You know, The Sun Also Rises didn't become a book about limp pilots in New Jersey. It stayed more or less the same. It just changed characters. So we have to discover our story, and we do this through many, many drafts. Um, Brad's talk earlier had that controller feedback loop. That controller feedback loop is essentially this exact same process, just at a human scale, instead of using, you know, math. Um, you write a draft. Through that draft, or through other means, you're gonna learn about what that story is that your code wants to tell. And you can then rewrite your draft, applying the knowledge that you learned. And then you repeat this. And because code is always a draft, you repeat this forever, until you are dead. Enjoy. So we can get into these steps a little bit more. Um, write a draft. Like I've said, code is always a draft. This part, step is the easiest. Just write some code. It'd be great if it worked. I don't think it has to. You're gonna then learn about your story. And this can come in through different methods. Maybe it's bugs. Maybe you're gonna get feature requests. Maybe you are gonna find your code hard to use or test, or maybe someone else on your team is. There's other ways, but I think these are probably the main ways that we learn about the story that our code is trying to tell. And now the big magic step, apply that new knowledge. And I'm gonna to have to punt on this. This is, that whole book is how to apply your new knowledge to code. It is full of patterns on how to take your code and change the story that it tells. And I think it's a book, this was true for me, that a lot of us had on our shelves but haven't actually ever really read. And I spent a lot of the last year trying to actually really read this book. And it's probably a very different book than you expect. Uh, but it takes some time, a lot more time than I can get into in a 20 minute talk. But I can show you a quick example. So if I go back to that lemur IO code, we have our current knowledge. People want to rename lemurs with one of our randomly selected lemur names. And then our knowledge changes. We get a feature request. Users want to maintain their own set of names and use those for renaming their lemurs. So now we have a new story. We want to update each lemur with a random name from the user, if they have that, or from our default lemur names. Then we want to just change our story. We have not made a big change here. All we've done here is follow the add parameter refactoring pattern from that Martin Fowler book. And it doesn't look like we've done very much. But this one structural change has changed the story that our code tells. We're now saying, update each lemur with a random name from their provided names. And if there is no provided names, you know, use the default. So what have we done here? We changed, we changed the structure. We didn't change the style. Stylistically, this code is the same. But the structure has changed. So it'll probably not surprise you that I would call this structural refactoring. Uh, Fowler has a presentation where he talks about different types of refactoring. Um, preparatory is a term he uses for this, planned, long-term, but those are all really terms about when you're going to do it and not so much about what you are changing. So I use the word structural because that's what you're changing. So what can structural refactoring do for you? What is it you're gonna get out of it? You're gonna be able to change your story. You're gonna be able to take that knowledge that you learned about your code and what it needs to do, and you're going to encode it into something that you can check into source control. But what it doesn't do, and this is the really crappy part, is it doesn't make it easier to write perfect code the next time. Because perfect drafts don't exist. That in itself is an oxymoron. If they were perfect, then they're not drafts. If they're drafts, then they're not perfect. But yet, and I think this is the mental block that a lot of us have when it comes to refactoring, is we look at code that we wrote and it makes us sad or it makes us angry. We want to write great code right away. You know, the shorthand for this is we all want to be rock stars. And I hope somewhere in all of our brains we know that rock stars don't exist and that whole idea is a piece of crap. But 
it's still there, right? What we can take away from this is that every writer, every professional famous writer that you've ever heard of or read has the same secret. They write, and then they rewrite, and they rewrite, and they rewrite until they get to publish, lucky people. And we can take this lesson, and we can apply it to ourselves and use it to make our own refactoring a lot easier. And the first step there is to admit that our own code is a draft, right? If you realize that that code is not set in stone, then it's going to be easier to accept and focus on the improvement that new knowledge that you need to encode into it. The alternative is to be upset that you wrote bad code in the first place, or to curse the programmer who wrote that code in the first place, which, honestly, I do a lot. Uh, and it's a bad practice, and I try to stop myself. If you do admit that your code is a draft, then you can kind of move on to the next step, which is that you can start to revel in your increasing smartness. I have a project that I'm working on right now that has a bunch of really gross metaprogramming, and I tried to fix it. And I got like 75% of the way there. And I hit a wall where I just don't know how to fix the problem that I see. Like I'm just, I'm not smart enough. I don't have this knowledge yet. At some point I will, right? And then I could make that change. And then when I do, I get to be really proud that I've actually taken this code to a new place. I will have gone from a place of less knowledge to a place of more knowledge, which I think sounds great. But I need to stop there and say, well, this is still draft code, right? Yes, I fixed this metaprogramming grossness, but this code is going to change again soon. A lot. And this is the point of that kind of bizarre talk title. Hemingway didn't start off just writing Hemingway-like prose, right? He improved through mistakes and rewrites. And that is true of every real writer. And as we've proven logically, now that includes you. So that's me. Um, contact information is there. I want to thank those folks for helping me get this talk together. Uh, it ended up being a lot different than I expected. I really want, I, I was trying to find a way to show git commits as a GIF, because what you would see is here's a bunch of green, and then it just got deleted, and then a whole bunch more green, and then a bunch of red, and a bunch more green, about six times. So. I was following my own advice here and doing a lot of rewriting, and they really helped me out. Um, I don't want to keep you from lunch, and it is noon, so if you have any questions, just come up and get me later. Thanks.